The Bracelet by Yoshiko Uchida and Joanna Yardley. Emmy didn't want her big sister to see her cry. She wiped the tears away quickly, but couldn't wipe away the sadness inside. It's almost time to go, her mother called, and Emmy knew they would have to leave their home soon. She looked around her room. It was empty now as the rest of the house, like a gift box with no gift inside, filled with a lot of nothing. Emmy closed her eyes and tried to remember how it looked. Flower chintz curtains at the window, her clothes scattered everywhere, her favorite rag doll and teddy bear sitting on the chest. She could even remember how the whole house looked if she closed her eyes and kept pictures of it inside her head. Emmy and her family weren't moving because they wanted to. The government was sending them to a prison camp because they were Japanese Americans, and America was at war with Japan. They hadn't done anything wrong. They were being treated like the enemy just because they looked like the enemy. The FBI had sent Papa to prison of war camp in Montana just because he worked for a Japanese company. It was crazy, Emmy thought. They loved America, but America didn't love them back, and it didn't want to trust them. Emmy ran to the door when she heard the doorbell. Maybe, she thought, a messenger from the government would be standing there, tall and proper and buttoned into a uniform. Maybe he would tell them it was all a mistake and that they didn't have to go to camp after all. But when Emmy opened the door, it wasn't a messenger at all. It was her best friend, Lori Madison, who was in the second grade with her. She hadn't come to walk to school with Emmy, and she hadn't come to ask her to go roller skating, and she hadn't come to show her a new dress or to ask her to go to the store with her either. She came with a gift, as though she'd come for a birthday party. But she wasn't wearing her good party dress, and she looked just as sad as Emmy felt. Here, she said, thrusting her gift at Emmy, it's a bracelet. It's for you to take to camp. Lori helped Emmy put on the bracelet. It was a thin gold chain with a heart dangling on it, and Emmy loved it the minute she saw it. I'll never ever take it off, Emmy promised, not even when I take a shower. Lori gave Emmy a hug. Well, goodbye then, she said. Come back soon. I will, Emmy answered but she really didn't know if she'd ever come back to Berkeley. Maybe she would never see Lori again. She watched as Lori walked down the block, turning and waving and walking backwards until she got to the corner. Emmy couldn't bear to watch any more, and she slammed the door shut. When the doorbell rang again, it was their neighbor, Mrs. Simpson. She'd come to take them away to the center where all the Japanese Americans were to report. Come on, Emmy, get your things, her sister Daigo called. It's time to go. Emmy made sure her gold bracelet was secure on her wrist. Then she put on both her sweater and her coat so she wouldn't have to carry them. They could take only what they could carry, and her two suitcases were already full. Each family had a number now, and Emmy put tags with their numbers. 13453 on her two suitcases. Mama took a last look around the house going from room to room. Emmy followed her, trying to remember how each one had looked when they were filled with furniture and rugs and pictures and books. They went out for a last look at the garden Papa loved. If he were here now, Emmy knew he would pick one of the prettiest carnations and bring it inside. This is for you, Mama, he would say, and Mama would smile and put it in her best crystal vase. But now the garden looked shabby and bare. Papa was gone and Mama was too busy to care for it. It looked the way Emmy felt, lonely and abandoned. When they got to the center, Emmy saw hundreds of Japanese Americans everywhere. Grandmas and grandpas and mothers and fathers and children and babies. Everyone was clutching bundles and suitcases tagged with family numbers. Some people were crying, but most just sat quietly. Emmy's stomach was jumping up and down, and she wondered if everyone was as scared as she was. She touched the small gold heart on her bracelet and tried to feel brave. When she saw soldiers carrying guns with bayonets standing at every doorway, she was so scared her knees began to wobble. Will they shoot if anyone tries to run away? 
she asked her sister, but Reiko just shrugged. I don't know, she said solemnly. Maybe. Soon it was time for everyone to board the buses lined up at the curb. They would take them to ten foreign racetracks, which the army had turned into a prison camp. As the bus started down the streets she knew so well, Emmy kept her eyes on the window. They passed the Kato grocery store, where Mama used to buy bean curd cakes and pickled radishes. The windows were boarded up now, but Emmy saw a sign still hanging on the door. It said, We are loyal Americans. I am too, Emmy thought. We all are, but the army didn't seem to think so. The bus sped down to the water's edge and crossed the Bay Bridge, looking silvery in the sun. Goodbye, bridge, Emmy whispered. Goodbye, San Francisco Bay. Goodbye, seagulls. Emmy glanced at her sister sitting next to her and could tell she was trying hard not to cry. Stupid army, Reiko was muttering. Stupid war. And the, when they were at the ten foreign racetracks, there was barbed wire fence all around it and guard towers at each corner. Armed guards swung open the gates to let the buses in and then closed them so no one could get out. They were locked in. They were assigned to Barrack 16, Apartment 40, and Papa's friend, Mr. Noma, helped them look for it. It wasn't among the massive army barracks built around the racetracks or in the infield. In fact, it wasn't a barrack at all. It was a long stable where the horses had lived, and each stall had a number on it. Well, here it is, Mr. Noma said as he came to a stall marked 40. This is your apartment. Emmy and Daiko peered inside. Gosh, Mama, it's filthy. No matter what anybody called it, it was just a dark, dirty horse stall that still smelled of horses, and the limnoleum laid over the dirt was littered with wood shavings, nails, dust, and dead bugs. There is nothing in the stall except three folded army cots lying on the floor. Mama tried to cheer them up. I'll have Mrs. Simpson send us material for curtains, she said. It'll look better when we fix it up. But Emmy could tell Mama felt just as bad as she did, and no one could think of anything more to say. Mr. Noma went to get mattresses for them. I better hurry before they're all gone, he said. He rushed off because he didn't want to see Emmy's mother cry. But she didn't cry. She just went out to borrow a broom and swept out the dust and dirt and bugs. It was just after Emmy and Eikos had set up the army cots that she noticed. My bracelet's gone, Emmy screamed. I've lost my bracelet. Emmy looked in every corner of their stall and along the ramp that led up to the stable. Mama and Eikos helped her, but no one could find it. It was getting dark, but Mama got out her flashlight and they walked back along the racetrack, retracing every step they'd taken. The track was muddy and full of puddles the rain had left the day before. They looked and looked, but they couldn't find Emmy's bracelet anywhere. It was time now to have supper at the grandstand. Emmy stood with Mama and Deiko at the end of a long, weaving line, each of them clutching a plate and a fork. But all she could think of was her bracelet. Already she'd lost the one thing that would help her remember her best friend. Emmy wanted to cry. The next day, as Emmy unpacked her suitcase, she found her favorite red sweater. She remembered how she and Lori had both worn their red sweaters on the first day of school. They had matching lunch boxes too. And after school, they'd gone to fly kites in the vacant lot near home. Emmy could just see their red and yellow kites dancing in the wind. And suddenly, Emmy knew she was remembering Lori that very minute, right inside her head. Just the way she could remember every room in her house in Berkeley, maybe, she thought, she really didn't need the bracelet to remember Lori after all. Mr. Noma came to put up some shelves for them. He'd even made them a table and a bench from scrap lumber. The first thing Mama put up on the shelf was a photo of Papa, but Emmy knew she didn't need a photo of Papa to remember him. It was as though Mama had the same thought. You know, Emmy, she said, you don't need a bracelet to remember Lori any more than we need a photo to remember Papa or our home, or all the friends and things we loved and left behind. Those are things we carry in our hearts and take with us no matter where we are sent. 
Emmy knew Mama was right. They would soon be sent to a camp in the Utah desert, but Lori would still be in her heart even there. Lori would always be her friend, no matter where she was sent, and Emmy knew she would never forget Lori, ever.